clouds, seeming like dark clay outside, liquid wax within, rain down upon Venkatam, where the handsome lord dwells. So sang the 9th century woman poet saint Andal from Tamil Nadu about the Lord Vishnu, betraying a poetic insight into the metallurgical practice of lost wax casting of bronze, which flourished in medieval southern India under the mighty Cholas in the 10th and 11th centuries. The celebrated Nataraja bronze of the Hindu god Shiva holding the drum and the fire is thought to reconcile eternal cycles of creation and destruction with the geologist turned art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy described as poetry but nonetheless science. This image has been an icon of the great traditions of performing arts, music and dance in southern India. Indeed, as implied by Andal, the lost wax casting process itself does have a mystical and ephemeral quality. The image to be cast is carved of wax and invested with clay to make a mold and melted out and then metal poured in to take the shape of the wax model. This is an age-old practice followed by the great hereditary communities of Sthapatis who follow the artistic conventions of the Silpa Shastras. They claim allegiance to the remarkable five-fold Vishwakarma artisanal group, which was responsible for so much of the great legacy of Indian fine arts, as pointed out by art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy. The notion of Vishwakarma as the chief architect of the gods and maker of the world reverberates through a lot of Puranic lore and imbues the lives of several artisan communities. Ananda Kumaraswamy also pointed to the meditative quality of the Indian sculptors who were steeped in the Dhyana Shlokas or hymns. All the organic materials of wax and clay in this process are recycled and reused. But metal too is recyclable and there is another unsung saga of a great metallurgical tradition in southern India of the wrought bell metal symbol and vessel makers of the Malabar made by another resilient historic artisanal group, the Kamalar or bronze smiths, who also constituted part of a five-fold community of artisans or Pancha Kamalar according to Chola inscriptions. The Kamalar have sometimes been regarded to be part of or conflated with the better known nomenclature of the crafts grouping of Vishwakarma. The meaning of the term Kamalar has been variously described as being derived from the Tamil word Karnalan, the man with the eye, or the Sanskrit word Karmakari, the one who makes. medieval Chola period saw a tremendous efflorescence in a range of fine arts and crafts traditions ranging from about the late 9th century to the 13th centuries. These covered the arts of sculpture, bronze image making, metal casting, making of ritual bells which were used in worship and a whole range of artifacts from uh, lamps and such like the legacy of which we still see in this Kaveri Delta, this very fertile and rich Delta region. The Kamalar of Tamil Nadu and Kerala made ritual and utilitarian artifacts in bronze such as bells, vessels and symbols. The bell metal plate is part of a rare tradition of making wrought bell metal vessels by the Kamalar community which once was practiced in Nachar Koil but now only survives in marginalized pockets, for example, in Kerala. In fact, when I went to Nachar Koil in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, uh, rows of uh, homes were manufacturing this velakum, you know, this uh, what you call bell metal. Hmm? Lamps. Yeah, bell metal lamps and also bell metal tagadu, what do they call the single, you know, the, the, the plate. 
The elusive bell metal plate represents a skilled indigenous technology of heightened bronze working which the Indians had pioneered and mastered as seen in some of the finest and earliest known examples from the South Indian Iron Age sites such as from Tamil Nadu and early historic Northern India. And this was a very widespread tradition across India, not only in Southern India, but also in Eastern India. But it has now all but died out, save for a handful of families of symbol makers and vessel makers of the Kamalar community in places such as Kerala. The verdant southern Indian state of Kerala is home to many rich performing arts traditions and metal working traditions that go back over centuries. Several of its rich performing arts traditions use metal instruments such as the gongs and cymbals. Thalam or metal cymbals is an exuberant instrument which is widely used in temple rituals. But behind the music is a tale of loss of a great metalworking tradition, a tale of remnant music and recycled metal the saga of the Kamalar. We are in the state of Kerala in southern India, in this lush green environments of the Malabar, flanked by lagoons and rivers. And we know from the 11th century Geniza documents that the Malabar was a thriving hub of production of metal vessels which were taken away as far away as Eden in the uh, Red Sea coast and that vessels were brought here to be turned. We know these from the accounts of the Jewish merchants who left behind these remarkable Jenniza documents. What would have been the kinds of metal works that were being produced? Well, we don't actually know too much from the archaeological record because there's been a tradition of so much of recycling of metalware. But we do have these remarkable examples of old lamps, velakas in temples and dotted across this fascinating land. And we're looking at one particularly remarkable example of uh, the temple lamp, which has the kurma or the tortoise at the base and several tears built up like that to make up this remarkable lamp, which has a nandi or the bull, seated bull right on top. Bell metal is generally the terminology used to refer to an alloy of a proportion used to cast bells of about 
20 to 25 percent tin with copper with about 10 percent lead added to make the alloy more castable but since unleaded bronze with a high tin content is very brittle it was not used very widely this is known as vengalum however there is another process of using unleaded binary copper tin bronze of a high amount of tin by a process of forging followed by quenching to reduce the brittleness which is referred to as wrought bell metal and several early ethnographic writings mention the making of this wrought bell metal alloy in different parts of India. This is more accurately described as binary heightened bronze. Symbol making is one of the declining traditions still practiced in the village of Kulamuk in Patambi district of Palghat. Mohandas hails from a traditional family of Musaris or metal casters. Mohandas was explaining that he'd learned symbol making from his father who made Kinnam and was one of the Kamalar community. The kinnam are lustrous vessels of wrought bell metal made by a similar process as the cymbals. Now the gongs and cymbals are amongst the few survivals of the process of wrought bell metal working. It's quite an extraordinary moment for me as an archaeometallurgist. In one sense where I am as an archaeometallurgist delight, I'm surrounded by all these wonderful bronze vessels which are made of a very unusual type of alloy heightened bronze uh, that is copper alloyed with about 23 percent tin and this is a tradition which goes right back to antiquity in the Indian context back in the megalithic period as well we find these remarkable heightened bronzes especially from southern India from the Nilgiris and Adi Chinalur uh, Iron Age and megalithic sites and these had been made by forging an ingot of about, uh, you can see here for example this, this very large vessel which has been forged by starting with an ingot of about 13 or 14 centimeters and then it is hot forged, uh, this 23 percent tin bronze at a temperature range of about 600 to 700 degrees centigrade and then they were able to forge a vessel of size of about 24 centimeters uh, in length, diameter and about 8 to nine, even 9 centimeter in height. So it's a very, uh, normally bronze cannot be forged this much but this was also because they had developed very great skills in forging heightened bronze. Normally you never find such heavily forged hot, uh, uh, hot forged heightened bronzes and these are some of the most extraordinary examples. It's also a very sad and poignant moment because these are not going to be entering a museum where they should be, the rightful place, all this rich heritage of Kerala. But these are all destined uh, as crap because what has been happening is that there has also been a parallel tradition of making symbols of heightened bronze of 23% because these, uh, this alloy is a very musical alloy and the quenched martensitic bronze has very good musical properties which were also recognized in antiquity in India and Southeast Asia. And gongs were made by a very similar process of uh, making alloys of heightened bronze of 23% tin and then forging them and quenching them. And these symbols have been made by exactly these processes. And now the market seems to only be there for the symbols and of course the craftsmen readily recognize that all of these heightened bronze vessels and all that are also made of the same alloy which is these are called Otupatram now and the symbols are called uh, Talam and so a lot of these Otupatrams which were traditionally made to store food because the heightened bronze alloy is also less corrosive and so it used to be used to store curds and many other varieties of food 
When I had come here first in 1990, there was one master craftsman in Patami, Kamal Bhaskaran, who no longer does this work. And in his workshop, they were still making these very large hot forge vessels, which is no longer being done. And now these are all going to be melted down to make uh, the symbols. So. In one sense, it's an example of the continuity of traditions, but there's also the loss of antiquities resulting in this. And the alloys are too expensive for the craftsmen to afford to buy. And unless these crafts can be sustained by actually making available the raw material for the craftspeople, the situation is that once all of these types of vessels and artifacts are melted down, a the crafts will stop, and in the b in the process, we would also have lost a lot of antiquities. When we look at bronze, uh, bronze with a low amount of tin, which is about 10% tin, is, as I said, uh, the kind of material that we normally find in antiquity, which is called leaded tin bronze. For example, a lot of the Chola bronzes are leaded tin bronzes. However, the point is that as you keep adding tin, bronze actually becomes very brittle and breakable. And that is also why we don't find a lot of examples of bronze with a higher tin content uh, in, in the ancient world. And it was only in some parts of Asia, especially in India, and also in Southeast Asia and so on, that this heightened bronze alloy was used. Astonishingly, from the megaliths of Adi Chinalur, we find extraordinary examples of heightened beta bronze. The microstructure of a wrought and quenched heightened beta bronze vessel from Adi Chinalur shows that it has the islands of alpha interspersed in an extensive matrix of beta phase, needle-like beta phase, which has been retained due to the quenching process. This is also seen from the megalith of Kodumanal excavated by the State Archaeology in Chennai, which yielded an extraordinarily thin perforated vessel. Bronze of a composition of about 23% tin has been extensively hot forged and then quenched to give vessels of an extraordinary thinness down to less than a millimeter. But there's a very interesting account going back to the time of Alexander's general Nyakis, who uh, visited the Indus region and according to Strabo's geography, uh, Nyakis is said to have observed, this would have been in about the 3rd century BC, he observed that the Indians used vessels which were like pottery because they shattered like pottery when they were dropped and you can see here this breakage of heightened bronze very clearly and also they can be broken very easily which is what they do when they remelt them and so this aspect actually differentiates it from normal bronze which is not quite as brittle as higher tin bronzes and you can see here this spectacular breakage Mohandas explains that the Musa or crucible to melt the order or the broken vessels of heightened bronze. The broken pieces of heightened bronze vessels are weighed meticulously on scales. According to the size of the symbols to be made, they are weighed into crucibles of 2 kilos or 3 kilos. Uruku is the process of melting the metal. For the process of uruku or melting of the broken vessels, the furnace is being prepared over time. 
the musa or crucible is kept on the hearth for melting. The ullai or hearth is being prepared and the charcoal is being prepared to put into the furnace. The temperatures for melting the beta bronze alloy are around 650 to 700 degrees centigrade. Mohandas has measured out broken pieces of the alloy amounting to 2 kilos to be melted into the symbol. The tonality of the heightened beta bronze alloy can be heard. Each plate full of broken vessels is fed into the flame lovingly. It has been a long tradition with householders that the old and tarnished bell metal vessels were given over to the scrap merchants to be melted down and recycled and forged into fresh ones. The Kamalar too see their role in refashioning scrap metal in an affirmative light. In yet another process of creation emerging out of destruction. At the same time as the melting for the metal goes on, Mohandas is preparing the mold for sand casting, the basic blank for the symbol. Without using any compasses or measuring instruments, the diameter of the symbol is being outlined. The meditative quality of this reminds one of the words of Ananda Kumaraswamy of the process of dhyana involved in craftsmanship. Rice husk is poured over the sand mold to give a refractory layer since it is very silicious and traditionally rice husk has been used as a refractory by several of the metalworking communities.
two open piece molds have been skillfully made without any instrumentation to achieve the required diameter of the symbols. Mohandas pours the molten metal into the flat sand mold Now the symbol blank is cast with the metal being poured in and left to cool and then to be shaped. The symbol blank is forged by a process whereby one holds the blank and two other craftsmen hammer it alternately while it is turned consecutively by the man holding down one of the blanks. Now this light golden yellow alloy of heightened beta bronze which is made of bronze of 23% tin which has been hot forged at around 600 to 700 degrees centigrade and then quenched has one property in common which is why it was used not only for gongs but also for vessels and also for cymbals, musical instruments is that it has this property of tonality. And it was used thus for making these musical gongs and a lot of the vessels also have this property of tonality and that's why sometimes they call them talavattu or musical vessel but it's just that the same alloy has different properties also non-corrosive properties and here the symbols which are made by melting and recasting and reshape fashioning all of these wonderful vessels also of course has excellent musical properties. And it's used in various performances in Kerala such as Kathakali and so on. So while there's only a market now for these kind of symbols, unfortunately with the use of uh, modern stainless steel vessels, all of these kinds of 
vessels have gone completely out of vogue and they're being collected by the scrap merchants and remelted to make gongs and cymbals for which there's still a demand. The symbol blank is forged by a process whereby one holds the blank and two other craftsmen hammer it alternately while it is turned consecutively by the man holding down one of the blanks. This is a similar process to what was being followed by the Kamalar who were shaping the wrought and quenched heightened beta bronze vessels in Parangadi in Palakkad district more than two decades ago. After one more cycle of annealing, the blank is hammered onto a stone anvil with a hollow and a knob is then made in the center of the symbol and then it is punched to create a hole. We can understand now how this exquisite megalithic artifact of Kodumanal of hot forged and quenched heightened bronze was made and hollowed out to such perfection with very fine perforations made of extraordinary thinness of about a one-tenth of a millimeter. Bronze with a composition of about 23% tin can be forged to a very high degree between 650 and 750 degrees centigrade due to the formation of a beta phase which seems to have quasi superplastic properties and can be forged to a great degree. Yeah. 
The microstructural examination of a vessel from Parangadi made two decades ago by the Kamalar in Kerala demonstrated that it was made by the same process of wrought and quenched beta bronze of a similar composition of 23%. A wooden mallet is used to do some final shaping to the symbol and then finally the dramatic moment when it is quenched and after that the second symbol of the pair is also quenched. <coughs> But I will also add that the quenching process was essential because by quenching the metal at the end of the forging process, the quenching is what prevented the formation of the brittle delta phase. And the quenching process is actually what made the metal less brittle than it would have been. So it was the quenching is done to prevent the embrittlement. And that was why they're called wrought and quenched Titan beta bronzes. And we saw them doing the quenching process for the symbols where they dipped it in the water for a few seconds. And that is really what helps to prevent the bronze from being as brittle as it might have been had it not been quenched. The prevalence of the quenched beta phase is what gives the musical tonality for which this alloy was so much sought and for which so many of those spectacular vessels were melted down because of the presence of an exact composition of beta bronze of about 23%. <laughs> This is the armor. This is the armor. This is the armor. This is the Chitty Amaga Perishagala Chitty. Chitty Chitty. The Codile Codile Purkale. Then a Palaga, Ulita Kala Palaga. The Langatana Paral, Ulita Kala Palaga. The Chitty These tools are similar to those which were used by the Kamalar who were forging the Otupatram or wrought and forged heightened beta bronze vessels. Thank <laughs> you.
As the artisans work away, the bright golden luster of the alloys shines through. This also explains why this alloy was used so widely in the vessels in antiquity due to the bright golden luster. It is very poignant that one of the last surviving Kamalar who worked on the making of wrought and quenched heightened bronze vessels is now deaf from the hammering sounds of the anvil. He was one of the Kamalar who used to work in the heightened bronze vessel making foundry and workshop of Abdul Rahim. Abdul Rahim, though a Muslim, also patronized the Hindu Kamala to make the ritual artifacts used by different communities. Abdul Rahim says that even now there is a demand for the use of odor or heightened bronze vessels for weddings, but that the Kamalar community have died out or have stopped doing this. He points out that the one who knew the exact melting point and weight of copper and tin to make the alloy was a Kamalan, whereas now the heightened bronze vessels are merely remelted. He says poignantly that the Kamalan have undergone Vamshanasham or destruction of their clan. The Kinnam and the heightened bronze vessels are required also in death ceremonies. Kalyanapathrangal, <laughs> So this is the Marachutiga, which is, uh, gives you an idea of the tonality. Tucked away in the lush green hills of the Nilgiri range in Tamil Nadu were several cairns and megalithic burials going back to the first millennium BCE, where the most extraordinary examples of rotten quenched heightened bronze vessels have been found, several of them again having been forged to an extraordinary degree with fluted shapes and beautiful decorations such as patterns of lotuses and concentric rings and so on. And some of these were also being practiced a couple of decades ago in the workshop of the Kamalar such as the making of the concentric rings.
The Todas are an indigenous community of the Nilgiris who have been living in harmony with the megalithic cairns and circles for generations. In the light of the finds of so many spectacular decorated heightened bronze vessels by Breeks in the Nilgiri Hills and Cairns, the Todas over generations have also been collecting and storing away heightened bronze vessels. Kamalar Mohandas indicated that different acoustic ranges of the symbols could be achieved by adjusting the hollowed portion in relation to the diameter. Mohandas also indicated that they had their own temple where they worshipped, dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu. This is part of a larger trend followed by the Vishwakarma communities of craftspeople and the Kamalar of Nachar Koil, where they followed largely autonomous worship practices. Kurumba Kuti from the tribal Kurumba community in Nadavarambu has been washing vessels and spectacular lamps and Urulis and Otupatram from the temples for years and she has watched the decline of these metal crafts. Several of these forms will vanish in the due process of recycling of metal. And so it is that the remnants of music that we enjoy bear the fingerprints of centuries of recycled metal. Mm -hmm. 